episode 292 of the Tennis Files podcast, you'll learn how to use time to your advantage during matches. Hey there, this is Maribon, and I'm really happy to be back for this week's episode to talk to you about how you can use time to your advantage during matches. I was actually um, out of town for quite a bit. Uh, I was in Orlando for a while, and then I was in England, and I uh, had a really great time at both places, played a lot of tennis in Orlando, and then played poker in England and visited some places. But yeah, now it's time to talk about how to improve your tennis game with respect to time. And I was studying uh, some previous summit sessions uh, because there's so much great content in them. And then I came across Louis Caillet's session, who he is um, one of the top coaches in the world, especially in the arena of double strategy. And he is with the LTA, the Lawn Tennis Association in Great Britain. And uh, I was watching his presentation from a previous summit, uh, actually last year's summit, on developing tactics. And then as one part of that presentation, he started talking about the element of time and various aspects of it. And that got me thinking about all the different ways that we can use time to our advantage during matches. So you can kind of think of this as as a theme for you to to use. And obviously these, these um, strategies and tactics that I'm going to mention in a second with respect to time. So the first part of this is to give yourself more time. So how can you do that? So during the point, you can give yourself more time by standing farther back. Obviously, if you're playing against a player who hits pretty hard and you just need more time, uh, whether that's to get your feet set or, you know, for your backswing, although you can alternatively um, shorten your backswing, uh, you can stand farther back. If you need to play more defensively, that helps. Uh, Another way to give yourself more time is to hit moon balls or slices so that way you can give yourself more time to recover Um, when i play matches uh, you know i try to play smart and so when i'm pulled out wide oftentimes uh, especially on the forehand i can do a buggy whip sort of shot that's like kind of a semi moon ball i guess you can also obviously hit even uh, a lob as well and then you can get back to the middle of the court or wherever you need to get with respect to where the ball uh, has been hit by you Another way to do that is to hit slower shots uh, as well. So again, you know, like with the moon ball and slice, you're usually hitting a slower shot, but also um, strategically as well, say for the serve. I was speaking with this about uh, one of my tennis friends before, and what that person does is um, they actually serve, you know, a second serve so that they can get to... Uh, the net quicker. So what I mean is, you know, say that obviously you've got two serves to hit on on their first serve, they're hitting, you know, a topspin serve uh, or a kick serve or something like that, as opposed to hitting a harder serve, because, you know, if you hit a fast serve, then um, by the time you have to hit a volley, you're often going to be at the uh, behind the service line, where if you hit a kicker or some, uh, you know, a slower serve, then you can get farther you know, closer to the service line or even past it but when you hit your first volley. Uh, another way to give yourself more time is in between points, obviously. Uh, you can take a longer break. So um, sometimes, let's say, if you're on a streak of losing, losing several different points instead of, um, you know, rushing through the break and just giving your opponent the advantage, you can take that time to uh, just max out your rest time and think about your strategy. I mean, I used to be what I just described, which is, um, you know, uh, I would feel like I should play to the uh, tempo of my opponent and whatnot. And you do to some extent have to do that, the returner, but uh, especially when you're the server, just take your time, compose yourself. And I like to use an in-between point routine that I first learned from Jeff Greenwald, who's on, I've been on several summits and the podcast. And the routine that he suggested, and this was actually from a few years ago, was to slap your thigh, play with your strings, feel your feet on the ground. That particular one is very powerful. And then to give yourself a, a positive mantra or say something you know, positive to yourself as well. And you know, some variation of this in-between point routine or that exact uh, routine itself can definitely help you to refocus instead of um, thinking about, you know, past events that may have gone a negative way for you. 
And then also, somewhat similarly, is during the changeover, uh, you can also just max out your rest time if needed um, and, and use that appropriately. So you can slow things down for yourself and, and you know, take a few deep breaths or close your eyes. Just, uh, you know, anything you can do to relax yourself if that's what you need. And, you know, same thing, like it used to be on the changeover where I would just like, whenever my opponent got up, I got up or I would just get up very quickly. But I've learned to kind of take as much time as I need now, have a drink of my water, have a a drink of my sports drink, a bite of my banana, etc. So that's another element of time there. And then now, you know, we covered how to give yourself more time. Now, uh, let's talk a little bit about how to reduce your opponent's time. So uh, one obvious way to do this is to hit the ball earlier. Let's say you can hit it on the rise. Um, Oftentimes I like to do this, let's say when I pulled my opponent off the court and, you know, I try to anticipate where they're going to hit the ball and then I uh, hit it on the rise to give them even less time. Uh, Same thing, you know, if you, you get a short ball, Uh, Instead of kind of waiting for the ball to come to you, uh, if you have the skill set, you can hit it on the rise and uh, rush your opponent. Another way to do this is to hit the ball, obviously, harder. And, you know, when you do this, I certainly would advocate that you aim for bigger targets, not the lines, obviously, then you have a much higher chance of hitting the ball out. But yeah, hitting it in the center of the court so that the net is lower as well and big targets. Um, That way you can. Uh, give your opponents a lot of trouble. And especially if the opponents, uh, you know, have trouble with, with hard hit balls, as I mentioned at the top of the show, or uh, if they have a big backswing uh, when you, when you like hit the ball earlier and or faster, then your opponent's going to have some real trouble there and you're going to be able to yield some errors from them. You can also position yourself farther up the court. So let's say on the return, you're farther up into the court, and then you're going to make contact with the ball um, quicker than you would if you were standing back, farther back, and uh, this can rush the opponent. And even doing that in itself, you see that sometimes uh, in both amateur and professional matches, when you do that, then the server is going to feel more pressure as well. So that's a really good tactic. Don't feel like it's a bad look or something like that and uh, you know it's just a strategy so positioning your yourself differently and farther up on the return can definitely help yourself out Um, also obviously getting farther up to the net as well will reduce your opponent's time you know whether you're uh, serving and then volleying getting up to the net that way or if you're returning and you do a saber sort of shot I think that sneak attack by Roger is is the uh, is that the original acronym or was there something before that I I forget but in any case you know chip and charge or just you know hit the ball flat or however you want to hit it and charging the net that's definitely uh, putting the pressure on the opponent giving them less time to react and then in doubles is similarly getting both of yourselves to the net as opposed to having one at net. When you have both, then you're pretty much guaranteeing that the opponent is definitely going to have less reaction time um, because either wherever they hit it, they're getting a volley back or maybe an overhead, which is even less time for them. I guess obviously the counter to that is, of course, you're going to have less time as well if you're hitting the ball on the rise or if you're positioning yourself farther up the court. So certainly, again, you need to have that skill set and it does take practice to time the on the rise shot uh, I think as Rafa said you know no one shot is the same and uh, even your technique will be affected by you know where you where the ball is where you're hitting it spatially speaking and whatnot so yeah it's definitely um, not easy so of course if you're you know, below a three five, then maybe you don't need to do this. Or if you, you know, you wouldn't want to deploy a skill as um, Jorge Capistani would say, as uh, you know, great coach. If it's not deployable, so in other words, you know, you don't hit on the rise shots much, and then uh, and you're not comfortable with it in a match. You don't want to break it out in a match because then it's not gonna work out well for you unless um, 
you've been hypnotized or I don't know, like you get extremely lucky, but I wouldn't count on it at all. Um, so yeah, as, as I mentioned, you know, and, and when you want to utilize this tactic of reducing your opponent's time, you want to see, does this affect my opponent, um, negatively? And if it does, then definitely, definitely do this. Um, also a way to reduce your opponent's time is to play quicker. So kind of the opposite of what I mentioned in the first part of the show where, you know, if you want to keep the momentum, like if you've been winning several points in a row, you usually don't want to slow it down. You want to just keep it going. Um, so you can do that. Obviously the opponent can take a break to counter that in some way, but sometimes they don't. And then another aspect of time that you can use here is to lengthen the opponent's time on the court. So this makes me think about Andre Agassi. Uh, He was famous for hitting balls just within the reach of his opponent so that they would struggle really hard and but get the ball back. He would do this to extend the rallies and then tire them out. Um, So it's really a great strategy to create longer rallies if you um, want to gain the upper hand in terms of fitness. And also alternatively, create longer rallies if your strength is your fitness, your endurance for, you know, explosive movement and stuff, obviously, because tennis is not just purely endurance, it's just kind of a mix. But if that's your strength and your opponent also doesn't do well with longer rallies as well, then you do want to create longer rallies. So that's another way. So, yeah, I mean, it's just, um, you know, this was kind of a quick way or a quick episode on how to use time to your advantage. So whether that's giving yourself more time through your positioning or how you utilize the time, or if it's reducing your opponent's time with the way you hit your shots or position yourself, or whether it's the way you lengthen your opponent's time on the court, uh, especially if they're not Uh, that fit or if their game style is like super aggressive coming to net things like that um, you can use time to your advantage during matches so I hope that you enjoyed this episode Um, definitely shorter than most especially you know interviews but um, yeah that's pretty much it and yeah I'm really looking forward to, to just creating more content for you all and I've been working pretty hard on my summit preparations already. Tennis Summit 2023 is coming up in mid-April. I believe April 17th to 22nd are when the sessions are going to be online. It'll be a mix of live sessions and presentations that our coaches do like on the court and also a few slideshows as well um, and some interviews too and yeah really looking forward to all that I've got some really great instructors for you um, some that you're very familiar with from previous summits and then some that will be new and we'll be covering um, strategy fitness technique and the mental game very interesting I conducted a survey just to see what you all want to hear the most on the summit. And usually um, technique is really up there, but surprisingly, technique came in a close third. So we've got um, strategy um, in the clear lead, and then the mental game edged um, technique for second place just by a couple of votes. And then there's technique and then fitness. And we've got equipment and coaching and some other stuff. But yeah, super interesting to hear that and um, really appreciate you all who um, filled out the survey because I got a lot of great ideas about what you all want me to cover or want us to cover rather. So excited about that. Another thing that I'm doing as well is I'm going to go to TennisCon Live, um, which is in Tampa with my friends Gigi and uh, Gigi Fernandez, that is, 17-time Grand Slam champ and Peter Freeman from Crunch Time Coaching. They're going to be doing a live camp there. So I'm going to be teaching a couple sessions down there end of next month, uh, which would be, you know, end of March. So I will put a link in the show notes page about that as well. And yeah, besides that, I just hope you're improving your game and staying healthy, staying fit and, you know, working on whatever will give you the most ROI for your game. 
I also just want to leave you with a quote, as I often do at the end of the show, and this one is by Albert Einstein, pretty smart guy if you haven't heard of him. And he said, try not to become a person of success, but rather try to become a person of value. A um, really good way to you know, approach uh, everything, really, rather than just trying to constantly accomplish and just kind of for the sake of people seeing you succeeding, rather if you're, you try to help others and become valuable, then that's going to pretty much lead you where you need to go and you'll be much more fulfilled. So yeah, and also I would really appreciate it if you leave a review for the show and you can do that by going to tennisfiles.com slash Apple Podcasts with an S at the end, I believe, and leaving a review there or doing it in your favorite podcast app of choice. It's just that Apple Podcasts is the most impactful in terms of the rankings and making the show more visible to everybody. So you're helping everybody else in addition to my, uh, myself in the show by leaving a review. So thanks so much. And yeah. All right. Well, I'll leave it at that and I'll see you on next week on another episode of the Tennis Files podcast. This is your host, Mirabhan Aranshad, signing out. Take care and have a great day.